Hey, everybody. Welcome to the newest episode of Footnotes. Uh, this is a VOD and podcast where we review the sermon from Fellowship Church and maybe get into some of the text that wasn't covered. Uh, this particular episode is going over the sermon, Free at Last, preached October 6, 2024 at Fellowship Church by our lead pastor, R.D. McClinigan. Uh, I'm Greg Pinkner, and yesterday we were looking at Galatians 5, uh, verses 13 through 15. Now, uh, the point of all this passage is it's reflecting on the passage before it, which is saying the law sets you free. The, uh, the cross sets you free from the law as a burden to salvation and becomes the pathway of your sanctification. And if, you, if you're confused by those terms, last week uh, on Footnotes, we covered uh, those kind of categories. So you can go check that episode out if you're confused by that and come back to this one. But let's dive into this because really what uh, R.D. was getting at yesterday was that the freedom that the law gives you, uh, the freedom that the law gives you is meant to be put to use for your growth as a Christian and the good of the kingdom, that these are kind of these two wrapped ideas. They're not separate. They're together. Because every part of you that grows in Christ becomes a testimony to the kingdom and its truth. So all of it together becomes an ideal of showing the glory of God, putting it on display, uh, and pushing it into the world as a testimony. I mean, Jesus, Paul, uh, throughout the New Testament say things like, don't hide your good works under a bushel. Like, show them. Let the world see your good deeds. And and think much of you so that, that when God returns, you are held in honor. Uh, in verse 14 of Galatians 5, uh, Paul goes to this, I- or, uh, this idea of, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So uh, R.D. did a great job of, of kind of pointing this out, that the law was not meant to crush us anymore. It's supposed to guide us now. If before our salvation, the law can only show you how sinful you are. But upon the cross of Christ, you are declared righteous because of the cross of Christ. Therefore, you don't need the law to justify you anymore. Christ justifies you. Now the law becomes how we live. And there's all kinds of things in the ways that the law was changed after the cross of Christ. For example, probably the most famous part of the Mosaic laws in Judaism were the food laws. Uh, Kosher is what it's called, and you're probably familiar with it from movies or TV or whatever. Uh, But the big rules are there were foods that the Jews could eat, and there was foods the Jews couldn't eat. And part of their issue with Gentiles or everybody who wasn't Jewish was these food laws. We can't be around this kind of food. Well, uh, the Apostle Peter in Acts has a vision from Christ where he, Christ gives him a vision of all these foods that are not kosher. And he tells him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's like, uh, no, those are against the law. And uh, Jesus says to him, do not call unclean what I have made clean. Um, and in doing so, what Jesus is actually saying to him is twofold. One, it's you're not made pure by your food anymore or unpure by food. You're made pure by Christ and you know it. So these things aren't unclean anymore. But he's also talking about Gentiles that were going to become Christians and be cleansed. And so the Jews and the Gentiles should come together as the church. And so when Paul, get, when, uh, when Paul writes this and quotes Jesus for saying, uh, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is a very uh, Jesus thought. And it very much comes from his uh, conflicts with the Pharisees, where they ask him, what's the greatest, uh, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. Now, why is it saying this big picture on love one another? What is, what is the Holy Spirit's movement in that? And why is it considered the best good? Now, it seems obvious to us that we would say, of course, love is the most important thing. I mean, the the New Testament's crazy about it, about love. Well, it is crazy about love, but the way our culture defines love 
is not how the New Testament define love, defines love. We experience love mostly as a feeling, and that's what we're looking for, a feeling. It's why marriage is such a disaster in our culture right now, because people think love is the feeling of when you first meet, right? When you first are dating, that's love. Now, that's called limerence, and it's different. Love is a decision and a choice. It is a commitment. And so when you see that, the, the, what the Bible's saying is commit yourself. Commit yourself to the good of your neighbor. Commit yourself to the good of your family and your brothers and sisters in Christ and your church and the lost. And commit yourself to these ideas. That's more of what the New Testament is saying. And so, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that happened out of Christianity, or early Christianity, rather, uh, was called uh, the Desert Fathers and Mothers. Okay, so uh, it's important to remember that right after Jesus ascended, um, he told the disciples, you know, hey, go make disciples, obviously the Matthew 28, go make disciples everywhere, and behold, I'm with you always. And then he rises into heaven. Well, the apostles, of course, then become the head of the church. And they start trying to organize the church. And then Paul becomes an apostle. And they start spreading the church through the Roman Empire. Well, as you know, the Roman Empire pushes back. They start killing the apostles. Um, John is the only one who really lives out his full life. All the other ones are executed by either the Jews or the Romans. And after that time ends... Uh, we have what we call the early church fathers. And we have letters from the second generation of Christianity, if you will. So if the apostles are the first, the second. We have letters from some of those guys. We have letters from a guy who uh, is kind of talked about as the, the apostle John personally discipled him. We have letters from that guy. And so those early movement, one of their ideas was Jesus is coming back really soon really soon. And Christ had anticipated that. And he said, don't go look out in the desert for me. Don't go to the wilderness. Stay here and live your lives. And the apostle Paul reasserted that. Live your lives in good ways. Be a peaceful people. But what happened was the people thought Christ was coming so soon that they would go out into the desert and just start sitting there waiting for Jesus to come back. This is what starts the monastic movement and the, you know, the nuns as a covenant movement, a, a convent movement, excuse me, um, where they're just out in the desert alone. They don't mess with anybody. They just sit there waiting for Jesus to come back, which is the exact opposite of what Jesus told us to do. It's the exact opposite of what the greatest commandment, the second greatest commandment, and what Paul says all the law is summed up in love your neighbor. How can you love your neighbor when you don't have a neighbor? right? It was meant to be a call to stay where you are and love the people around you and begin to show them the goodness of the kingdom. So one of the most controversial books in the New Testament is a book called Philemon. And in Philemon, uh, Paul is writing to a slave owner, and he is writing on the behalf of a runaway slave. Well, this runaway slave um, you know, he's run away. He's become a Christian. Paul finds out, oh, you ran away. You have to go back. You have to make it right, which is completely and totally abhorrent in how we understand slavery. But again, uh, if you've heard any of our podcasts or any of these kind of things, uh, the slavery in the Roman Empire was very different than slavery as we think about it. You know, the, the African chattel slave uh, routes and things like that. That's not what it was. It was mostly based on debt. And so this guy's running out on his debts. And Paul's like, no, uh-uh, go back. And he writes this owner of this slave and says, hey, you remember how good I was to you? You should be good to this guy too. And in other places, Paul tells slaves, stay where you are. That's abhorrent to us. But remember what he's saying. He's saying, fulfill your obligations. Be a good person in your society. You owe money, pay it back, right? He's saying, stay where you are with your families, love them, call them. And it's not easy. Running off to the desert is easy. I know you're going, that doesn't sound easy. You, you know what I'm talking about. Um, 
So when you see this, it says you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's not a aspiration of an emotion, right? It's not going to make sure you feel this way because you're not going to feel that way all the time. You know, uh, if you're single and you're, you're, <laughs> you're listening to this or watching it, you're sick of married people telling you how hard marriage is because you just want to get married. And then you get married and then you find the single people around you and go, it's so hard because you don't feel that way all the time. But the love is the commitment. It's the vows. It's the promises you made. The love is the commitment to the relationship. And that's what we're actually called to. We're actually called in our discipleship to use our lives as a living testimony to the goodness of Christ, the goodness of the kingdom, and to bring it into reality for those around us. And, you know, we're in all kinds of different spaces. Yes, I'm a pastor. I am mostly called to this church, and this is where most of my life is lived out. But at our, at our church are engineers and school teachers and, you know, lawn maintenance owners of companies or workers or mechanics or all kinds of people that will be in all kinds of places that none of the rest of our church will be at. And they are called to that mission field. Don't look for a mission field 10,000 miles away from you when there's one right inside your house or at your office. How you live it out varies as much as the opportunities do. But the call is always the same. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, thanks for joining us on Footnotes today. Uh, we're going to be here every time that we're in one of the books of the Bible. We continue in our series of Galatians for a few more weeks. And then uh, we'll see what comes next. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Footnotes. Take care.